thought this was going to be in the afternoon. So, good morning. My name is Mark Buchanan. I am a uh, conservation specialist with the Conservation Agency. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be doing a, a, a rain barrel workshop here uh, this morning. And uh, I was kind of kidding around with folks, but there's a lot of truth to it too. But we have to have a, this PowerPoint along with it because if we were just cutting three holes in a barrel, we'd be done in like five minutes. So I'm kind of trying to lengthen it out a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about, you know, method to the madness. Why, you know, why we as conservationists and natural resource professionals are concerned about harvesting rainwater. Um, at least, you know, it's, it's a means to an end, I guess we could say. It's a pretty important endeavor. Um, I'll start off, and I want to go over some real basic stuff with some uh, really basic hydrology. Um, look at uh, you know different types of collection systems, and then we'll go in and we'll put one of these together. And I, like I said, it's it's extremely easy, very easy. If you can if you can run a drill, then you can you can put every you can put it together. Uh, this kit and everybody that uh, that signed up. For the, uh, the class to get one of these kits. It's from an outfit called Earth Minded. And if I move too fast through the instructions on how to put this thing together, well, I, all you got to do is, is open up the instructions and you'll probably get a better version uh, than what I'm giving you. So, nonetheless, uh, everything is kind of compact and together. Um, in the past, we did presentations down in the city of Huntington um, when they first kind of started getting into their stormwater issues and we started working with the city. Uh, we did multiple storm water classes, I guess you said, we built some rain barrels. And we were pulling in pieces, uh, you know, plumbing parts and stuff. And he sent somebody to Lowe's with a list, you know, a three-quarter inch male in versus a three-quarter inch female. And you've got people, you know, at the end of the thing, like, yeah, thanks a lot, buddy, and just walking <laughs> off, you know, they, because it's just too much. This, on the other hand, this kit... Um, it's like I said, it's got absolutely everything. You won't have to have anything but a drill, uh, maybe a screwdriver. I mean, seriously, it's got all of the small parts you'll need, even the hole saws. It comes with three hole saws with the three appropriate sizes to drill the, the barrel and your uh, and your downspout too. It, it comes with absolutely everything. Even a nifty sticker to remind you not to drink the water out of the barrel. So that's really important stuff. No offense, but there's been some lawyers involved with this. <laughs> offense taken. <laughs> I don't need a label. To drink okay. Out. All right. With that said, we'll go ahead and get moving. Um, when I when I start this presentation, a lot of times I don't know what kind of audience I'm going to end up with. Sometimes I know people who are really in tune with this kind of topic. Most of the time, I end up with folks who aren't in tune with this kind of topic. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background information. Um, when we start talking about urban hydrology, what I always like to try to bring up is picture where we're at right now, or maybe you're, maybe you live in Charleston, picture Charleston, North Huntington, or wherever, insert small town here, whatever. 250 years ago, 300 years ago, whatever, looks a lot different. It would look a lot different than it does today. The main difference, the biggest difference, would be the amount of impervious surface that you have in that drainage area. When you have development, Inevitably, you get roads, um, paved roads, paved parking lots, ro roofs on buildings, houses, whatever. All of those shed water. It's just part of, the, just part of what happens in nature. But what happens is you move an awful lot of water into a stream faster than it can really be absorbed. And we'll explain it in just a little bit. So when you have urban hydrology versus native, you end up with greater runoff, uh, what we call flashy stream. In other words, uh, if you have an urbanized area like in Charleston, any stream that would happen to run through Charleston, you get an inch of rain. That stream is going to jump up really quick and flood. Sometimes flood, not always. It just depends on the amount of rain, right? You get, a, you get the water jumping up really fast, but it also goes down quickly too. It's a flashy stream. That's you know, what we call it. Um, other issues, you have increased erosion potential within stream channels. Uh, lower storage in soils and low groundwater recharge. And the reason we're in this is because of the degraded potential, or the potential for degraded water quality. And ultimately that's, uh, you know, as far as the program that TAM runs, we're part of the state's non-point source pollution uh, program, I guess we could say. We handle the agriculture and some of the, some of the stormwater stuff now, although officially it's not, I guess, in writing, but nonetheless we've been helping a lot of municipalities with stormwater type issues. 
And I throw this in here to put you to sleep. Um, <laughs> what you have here is a graph. Uh, across the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis, stream flow rate, or I, I like to think of it as volume. Uh, you have two curves here. You've got conditions right here. This is showing the volume of the stream prior to any type of development. As you move across, you have our nice little rainstorm here. You expect an increase in volume within the channel. Peaks right here. And then you have a nice gradual recession back down to the base flow. In an urbanized setting, just like I talked about, you have a lot of impervious surface, impervious you know, the roofs, concrete, parking lots. You end up with a really fast spike, a really high uh, discharge in a short amount of time. It wreaks havoc on the stream and, and water quality in general. And, you know, it's just the way things are, you know, and I'm not going to blame any, any engineers. Nonetheless, we always, you know, when architects and engineers would put designs together for buildings, the main thing was to get the water away from the foundation as quickly as possible. So that's what we did. Uh, and this is, this is your result as far as, you know, there was not a lot of attention paid to what goes on around the building, you know, big picture type stuff. So you end up with, with this. So, you know, we start talking about, you know, when you have this type of setup, you end up with, uh, you know, some effects. There are some effects to, to what goes on here. You've got, you know, increased potential for flooding. Everybody's favorite within our agency, stream bank erosion. Uh, an increase in turbidity, and turbidity is, is what you, when you measure how much sediment's actually suspended in the water. Uh, and the turbidity indirectly leads to habitat destruction. And, um, you know, what happens is when we have those increased bed loads, and it's too much for that stream to actually handle, the stream actually can be changed morphed into, into a different type of stream. You also end up burying a lot of thin, thick macroinvertebrate habitat. And those are just basically critters that spend part of their life cycle in that stream at the beginning of a food chain. So if you end up wiping these guys out, uh, you, you basically get rid of your bass and you know, your sport, your, your desired species of game fish, which can be an issue. Um, then there's other issues associated with these peak discharges, high peak discharges. Um, you know, changes in stream flow, like I, like I said, and that's, that's because of uh, point bars and things that end up forming. Uh, the stream abandons the floodplain. Uh, CSOs, uh, and that's an issue in Charleston as well as Huntington, these larger municipalities, Parker Firth. Um, infrastructure damage, and then the big ones, contaminated streams, rivers. And somebody, I was at a uh, conference last week, and somebody asked me, well, why would we be concerned with coastal water? Well, you know, we are in the Chis well, part of the state is in the Chesapeake Bay's watershed. The majority of the state lies within the Gulf of Mexico's uh, drainage. In other words, all the water that comes from these rivers around here ultimately will make its way down to the um, Gulf of Mexico. And there's, a, there's an area in the Gulf of Mexico that's so contaminated with excessive nutrients, it's a dead zone. It's about the size of the state of Connecticut, and the fishing industry is in a panic yeah, because the, it's a dead zone that the... the uh, the nutrients and stuff that end up in the water actually has, you know, causes the, uh, uh, the algae to grow. And as the algae starts to grow, it gets kind of rampant. Well, it dies. When it dies, the bacteria start to break it down. They use the oxygen that's suspended in the water. It's like a domino effect. And you end up with these huge areas that's called a hypoxia. You have these hypoxic regions of the Gulf where there's no fish or game, sport fish or commercial fish, too. So it's, it's a serious issue. They've got, I think there's more of a grasp on the Chesapeake Bay now. I'm, I'm speaking something about the Chesapeake Bay, and I don't know a whole lot about it. But the, the, at least there's a grasp on the Chesapeake Bay. And I keep looking at Pam because Pam runs those programs. So if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. But the, the, Gulf, of, the Gulf Initiative and those kind of things are just down the street from what it looks like. There's going to be probably a big push here about you know, watershed science, especially when it comes to ag, because ag, we usually get blamed for it. I don't agree with all of them. We can have a discussion after a while if you want to. Um, but how do we manage this kind of stuff? How do we manage this excess of runoff and, and keep that peak or, or lower that peak and have something that's a little more natural? It's not rocket science. We try to hold back as much as we can. Um, we do that, uh, and, and luckily, we uh, within our program, Pam, she's kind enough to, you know, she puts money down in our conservation district, and we get with our with conservation districts, we get to do like demo projects that concentrate on bioretention cells, you know, putting riparian buffers in. And a riparian buffer is basically just a wooded area along the stream. 
And real basic things like this can make a huge, huge impact, positive impact. Uh, stormwater planters, um, rain barrels, is not, yeah, rain barrels and cisterns. And yeah, I've been accused by a couple of engineers uh, in our offices, our NRCS partners, you know, here goes Mark with his barrels trying to save the world 50 gallons at a time. I'm not stupid. I know that we're not going to offset enough of a peak discharge here to make a difference. This, this, is, this is a conversation starter, is all this is. This begins the conversation to talk about it, to understand the concept. That's where we're at with this. So with that being said, you know, rain barrels and cisterns, um, two, two good ways to kind of capture and use rainwater. So and speaking of rainwater and using rainwater, again, not rocket science, it's been around. And, and you guys work with farmers just like we do. And, um, you know, they're very resourceful, you know. I've been on several farms, and you know, I always marvel at how resourceful these uh, ladies and gentlemen are. Um, this is a really old <laughs> setup here. He's got his, he's got his gutter run along, and basically the water spills down here. You can see where these, these pails are, where he's, he's kind of carried it, or she, either out to the flowers or the fields. These things can be very, very simple to the very, very elaborate as far as the rainwater collection system. Um, here you've got something like what we're going to do. Uh, which is just a really basic, all we're doing is trying to capture, uh, you know, runoff off of, a, off of a residential household. You know, I don't know who, what kind of sadist thought of this, but I couldn't imagine trying to do the plumbing on that. Um, this picture, I had an intern that worked with me a couple of years ago. I can't, that's horrible, I can't think of her name right this. And we were contacted by a school over in Wayne County. They wanted to do a rain drug, that they wanted to do something a little more elaborate. And Jessica, the intern, came up with this, and I shot it down almost immediately because I saw a lot of <laughs> risk on our part for, for taking part in something like this as far as the project because who knows if it would even work. But the point I was trying to make from the simple to the more elaborate to even more elaborate of, a, of an actual household system that kind of cut, catches and collects. This goes so far to even have, this is your pump down in the bottom right here, and you've actually got like a float valve here that will, you know, control levels and whatnot. I'm sure there's some sort of treatment system in this because obviously rainwater is, you know, not exactly clean, especially when it comes off of a roof. You're going to have that at first, what they call the initial flush. You'll have that first initial flush of whatever's on the roof if you have bird droppings. Um, sometimes you're going to have, uh, you know, asphalt shingles. It could be an issue because you could have some hydrocarbons kind of mixed in there. And I've, I've read some studies that talk about trace amounts of hydrocarbons in that initial first flush. And there's, you know, they'll sell you anything, you know, to, to answer a question, but nonetheless, there are things that you can put on barrels to capture that first flush. Never tried any of them, so I'm not, I'm not I'll tell you that they're there, but I'm not going to tell you whether they work or not, because I haven't tried them. I don't use them water food crop or anything. I just water flowers and wash tools and sometimes a car. And I'll explain how we do that in a minute. Um, so, how much water are we talking when we, when we start talking about a rainstorm? Uh, this is, uh, you know, to put things into perspective, I guess, and what I've done is you take, we try to figure out like what the, the average size home was as far as square foot uh, on the roof. About 1,500 square feet turns out it's pretty average around the state. If you multiply that area, that square footage off the house by the uh, inches of rain, and you multiply by 6.23, you'll end up with your total gallons that fall. So if you use this example, 1,500 square feet, inch of rain, 0.623, 934 and a half gallons. Now you see why the engineers think I'm a nut. Because we're not going to save the world with one barrel. You know, that barrel, this 50 gallon barrel will be filled up in about 30 seconds. The rest of it's overflow. So, again, it's conversation story. We're not fooling anybody. A lot of water. Some of the uses that you would have with this, the basics, watering landscape plants and lawns, cleaning tools. Uh, I always kind of guarded when I say watering vegetable gardens, just because of the hydrocarbon type thing or the asphalt shingles. Um, I haven't found one definitive um, study that will say one way or the other, you know, but there's definitely trace amounts of hydrocarbons can be in that first flush. Keep that in mind. I'll let you be the judge. Uh, Plus you toilets, the wife's not along with this yet. Uh, she's not too keen about me hooking up a, a, a rainwater flushing system for the toilet. So 
Uh, if, if it ever happens, I'll let you know. <laughs> benefits. Some of the benefits of using rainwater. The first and most obvious is free. No charge. Um, and it, I don't know if any of you guys with city water, usually if you're watering your garden, they base your sewage bill off of your water usage, which is not fair because you're not, you know, not all that water is going to be rushing down the sewer, but you still get charged for what, what you use. So it's free. Rainwater is softer. By this, we're talking the pH. The pH is just below seven, around six ish, around our part of the state. Um, anything above that, you know, seven and above is considered hard or more alkaline. A lot of minerals dissolved in it. You'll end up with, uh, you know, the scale and stuff that you have uh, some faucet handles and stuff. That's because uh, of issues with the pH usually being too high. Rainwater is softer, which some say is better for plants. Again, no minerals. Uh, no chlorine, supposedly better for your plants, and of course environmental, environmental benefits that I've been tallying up here. And when you get one of these, you got to set it up, and there's going to be a couple of ways that you can put this faucet on, and I, I like to put the faucet as low down on there as I possibly can, so I can have more water for my use, and that means I have to kind of set that up on a pedestal, whether it be cinder blocks or maybe a nice block foundation, it, all I want you to know is if you do that, it's it's heavy and make sure it's stable because if that thing tips over onto a small child, don't come calling me. You know, uh, <laughs> it's like it, water's heavy. And I think I've got a note on here somewhere. Yeah, eight pounds to a gallon. So if you get 50 gallons of water, 400 pounds, that's a big boy sitting there. And if it tips over, you know, it can do some real damage. You know, it could probably tear down your gutter, uh, you squish a kid, dog, cat, whatever. Nonetheless, uh, again, here we go. Do not use this drinking water. I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, and it should be uh, stored for extended amounts of time. So what's an extended amount of time? More than a week. We'll just put that out there. And it's going to vary plus or minus a little bit here or there. Um, a lot of these, this one kind of touts. It doesn't say that it's mosquito proof. I've never seen anything proof anything. You know, it's like 100% guaranteed, you know, for whatever it is that we're selling. But if, if I was to put... If I was a betting man, I'll put my money on this would be the closest thing that you could have to something that's mosquito-proof. Just the way the system's set up, it's not open. Um, the, the overflow, a lot of times when you have an overflow, the mosquitoes will get in through the overflow. You can't camp on this one. Uh, and the barrel's still on top, so it is pretty pretty tight. Uh, I'm going to stop with saying mosquito-proof, I won't say that. Nature always finds a way. Um, another thing you might want to be uh, concerned with, don't you know, store it for extended amounts of time, especially in the weather, when the weather turns cold, like we're getting ready to go into right now. We're getting to November and the nights are really starting to get down to those freezing points and stuff. If you have any water in the barrel, you run a really good risk of busting the barrel, you know, with the expansion when it freezes. But the way these things are put together, put together in a factory, and you can see the seam. Two, the two sides are molded separately, and then they're basically welded together. So this is a weak point all up and down, up, up it up one side and up the other side too. So if you have that freeze and thawing cycle, you can actually push it to the point where it actually split. And I've left mine out all winter and haven't had any issues, but um, it's, you're rolling the dice when you let it sit out. Sometimes I'm just too lazy to get taken off the, uh, the downspout and remove them for the winter season. So that's what we're talking about there. Can we go back to the cleaning? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, clean the barrel once or twice a month, especially during the summer. Um, obviously, you're going to have them down in the winter anyway, but uh, probably every six weeks would probably be sufficient. Usually, the ones we've done in the past, we've used a white barrel, and even though it's thick enough, you think it would be opaque, you'd be surprised at the amount of the algae and stuff that forms on the inside of the barrel. This is nice because you can, you can unscrew the top and clean it out for maintenance. Uh, you know, I, I usually a little bit of Dawn detergent or something like that. This detergent is going to be absolutely fine. Pa uh, take a hose and spray it and tip it over. All of this green slime will fall out. If you don't clean it, you run the risk of clogging up the plumbing uh, because that slime will actually fall down. And when you turn the water on to use it, it will actually try to draw that slime out. And the slime will kind of get gunked up into the, the faucet. It's kind of nasty. You shouldn't use bleach. Um, some people do use bleach. It's probably no problem with it if you don't have an issue with it. It's not going to kill anything. Just make sure it's diluted. Yeah. I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use it straight, though. Okay. Yeah, maybe dilute it. Like 50% solution or something like that. would probably be fine. So, yeah, yeah, definitely if you want to keep them you know, clean, that, that's the way to go. 
once or I'd say probably two times during the whole summer probably more than enough. I haven't had any results with these. These, as far as something being opaque, this is probably as, as close to opaque as we're going to get. I'd be surprised if you had anything grow on the inside, but with the warmer temperature, you're probably going to run the risk of having that happen. Especially in the summer. And this and I, I, this slide, this is an old slide. I should have taken it out. And if you're interested, like I said, this is the all-inclusive package everybody's going to get with the, at the end of the program today. This is uh, one of the builds that the intern I had working with me a couple years ago came together with. And it's pretty nice using one of the, the sealed top barrels. You basically put the plumbing in the bottom and flip it over. Um, and then this is an overflow. And if, if you guys have any other barrels at the, at the house, you know that your overflow is really important because two inches minimum diameter. This is this this doesn't fall in the same class. I've seen a lot of rain barrels where they'll have like these little tiny one inch openings, and after they get if the barrel gets full, it's shooting you know 10, 15 yards out to the yard, you know, 10 or 15 feet out to the yard. So yeah. A larger overflow is really important if you're going to do a design like this. And I can get you, if you're interested, I can get you the specs on this design. I think Jamie actually has a copy of that on the Watershed Resource Center. Those are a couple of, um, I'd call them bad designs. I, I, I've done this for a few years now, and I've noticed and see how things evolve. See how small the overflow is? Not good. This is more like what we're going to be doing today. Like I said, and you'll be, you know, the presentation, I mean, Three holes in the barrel and we're done. It's triple simple. Um, the way this overflow works, this little pipe right here is your intake, and it's also it does it has dual duty. It will actually uh, fill the barrel, and it also serves as an overflow, which sends it back down into your downspout. And I'll show you that in a second too. Uh, a few resources if you're interested. Um, if you if you want to, to be able to get some of these sites, if you're really into it. You can contact Pam or the Watershed Resource Center and they can get you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, which will include this. Okay? Any questions? All right. Let's build us a barrel. Let's go build a barrel. Okay. These barrels are all food grade, by the way. Barrels are all food grade and actually came from Greece. They got olives. Um, they, they carried olives in the barrels. And some of them, when you unscrew the top and you pop this lid off, there's a little rubber ring. You, if you toss the rubber ring, it's not a big deal. You don't have to have it. As a matter of fact, some of them are falling down in there and they're very difficult. This one, I use this one as a demo barrel because it, we dropped it off the truck. Um, it'll eventually pop back up when the sun hits it. Nonetheless. So this is our barrel, and yes, they do need to be cleaned up. They're pretty rough looking, got some dirt they, and whatnot. They need to be turned over before they load them. Okay, we had, we had some incidents. What you need to do is make sure there's you still got juices, and some of them even have a couple of olives in it. Olive, olive. Yeah, it's nothing bad, it's just a little bit of olive. It doesn't smell bad, it actually smells kind of good, but uh, I don't like the taste of olive. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to go put this on just for the sake of having it on. And like I said, you open up this kit, you're going to have a, a drill bit, and you're also going to have a hole saw. What you're going to do is back this off and put the first hole saw in here, just like so. somewhere near the bottom with a minimum of three inches. Well, this is more than three inches, and I would not put it on that sloping face. We might be forced to kind of have it up a little bit higher than we like if you get a barrel like this. Some of the barrels have these ribs up through them just like that, and some of them are more smooth, so a little bit of variation nonetheless. If you get one like this, I would definitely try to stay as close to that flat face as I could to prevent the risk of uh, you know, leaking. I'm also going to stay try to stay away from that seam up one side down the other, so I'm going to go ahead and punch this in.
would be for our faucet. Um, the next hole that you're going to put in is for a drain. And if you wanted to put it on the bottom, you could. I wouldn't recommend it just because you're, you know, you're going to, it might end up leaking on you. Um, and I'm going to go against what I just said a while ago. I'm going to go ahead and put it on the face of this right down here. And you, it's up to you. You're, wherever you want to drain it, it is absolutely fine. I'm going to go ahead and put it in here. Once you get those two holes drilled, you've got two little plungers or uh, two seals that are going to fit in here. Um, and it, it's a tight fit because it's going to be watertight. So if you have trouble, if you take a little detergent soap, you know, dishwashing soap, it should go right in. Or I guess you could dip it in a little bit of olive oil if you wanted to. <laughs> there, popped right in, just easy as pie. All right, now we're going to, this is for our drain. Stick that one in. Are they the same size? They're exactly the same size. And watch me not be able to put them in. I trust that. that. You just make it look easy. Yeah. I can think it's maybe easy. If I put it together, I'll be able to do it. Okay, here we go. So both are in now. It looks like that. The faucet, not exactly of the greatest material, but it's plastic and it'll work. It'll serve the purpose. Somebody asked if you'd have to have, uh, put the plumber's tape on the uh, threads. No, there's no need. If you want, you can. If it makes you feel better, knock yourself out. All right. You might have to hold it as you turn it to make sure it sits. Just like so. Now we've got our barrel faucet. This is going to be our drain. So in the, as we get late into the fall, we're done with the gardening season, we can come in and drain it. Just by opening this up. Why wouldn't you just use the faucet as the drain? Because I'm going to have about a foot of water still left over here. Let's see. Awesome. Huh? Awesome. Well, you could, like I was saying, in some barrels you can. If you do decide to put your faucet down further, and you make sure that you know that you're going to have to put it on a pedestal because you're not going to be able to put a hose right under there. So keep that in mind. Um, Just that easy. I mean, <laughs> just that easy. Gee whiz. All right, now we're going to put the uh, inch and a half on and punch it through. Maybe I can figure out how to work it. And this is where we're going to put our intake. Put that nut back on the back side. Just like so. All right, here we go. And that didn't take long at all. Are these included in the kit, Mark? Yes. All of the whole soles are included in the kit. Alright. I'm going to make a hole for this little attachment here. This is just the rubber seal. I'm going to come, and if you want it on the side, you can, because this actually can extend 
out over two feet. So, you know, keep that in mind. I like to put, you know, I usually set my barrels up to something like this, right directly in front of it. So I usually put it back directly opposite the side of the faucet. So let me go ahead and punch this in here. This, well, this step is kind of important. Um, let me get the holder. I'm going to try to get it on as flat a face as I can. Oh wait, and the most important for our lawyer friends, 
Don't drink the water. Okay. <laughs> or, or do. <laughs> or do if you want. <laughs> but you've been warned. <laughs> you've been warned, yeah. Huh? Did everybody get... Uh, 